Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 3. We came that far. We're in verse 1. We're just going to back up a couple verses because, again, you know when this was written, there were no chapter breaks. And so sometimes they put a chapter break in, whoever was assigned to do that, and they put them in some really weird places because it almost breaks a thought in half. And so sometimes we have to back up. Someone said to me the other day that they don't mind me backing up so much, but, you know, we were like in the middle of chapter 2, and I backed up all the way to chapter 1. But, but you know, we got to get a run at these things sometimes, amen? They're like uphill, and you got to get a run at it. So, But tonight is an interesting message. Uh, and there's a lot of application in it for you and I tonight. So uh, as you're turning there, put your finger there on chapter 3, verse 1 of Ezekiel, and let's pray. Father, you know, we so need that work of your Spirit to understand your Word. You told us that you weren't going to leave us comfortless, but you were going to send us another comforter, the Paracletus, the one who would come alongside to assist and to help. And that, Lord, he would be that agency by which, Lord, we would be led and guided as we study your word into all truth. And so, Lord, we want to thank you tonight in advance for that work of the Spirit in our hearts, bringing to our minds as we study your word the truth of it. And then we would just simply ask this evening that you'd give permanency to those things that we're going to study. Again, the Holy Spirit, you told us, Jesus, that he would bring all things to our remembrance. And you know, the older we get, like me, sometimes you need help with that. And so, Lord, give permanency to the things we study tonight. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me just give you a little review because what is going on in chapter 1, chapter 2, on into chapter 3, I think, personally, as you study the book Ezekiel, kind of sets the stage for everything else that's going to be happening as we make our journey through that. And we'll pick up speed, I guarantee you, after we get to the first three chapters. We're going to try. I can't make any commitments. But we're going to try to do a couple chapters a night. We'll see how it goes. Not just a couple verses. And we're going to move quickly. And then when we get to those those prophetic sections that really deal with what we are dealing with, we'll spend more time on those, okay? But the first three chapters are very interesting because in chapter 1, Ezekiel, as it were, has this wonderful, overwhelming experience with the Lord. He's by the river Shebar, which is about 150 miles north of the citadel where Daniel is at, the palace. And it's this little village kind of a community up there. And he's out on one of his prayer walks, as we've told you before. And as it were, heaven opened. Literally, heaven opened. As though the scroll was rolled back and Ezekiel is standing before the throne of God. He sees the cherubim. He sees the wheels inside of the wheels that represent the Holy Spirit. He sees the faces on the cherubim that represent the four gospels or the work of Christ. He sees the sea of glass. He sees the one seated on the throne, which is God the Father. And he has this experience and he face plants because of it. Now, we sang a song here tonight, I Can Only Imagine. Listen. Ignore all of the other things he's saying about what we're going to do when we stand before his throne. Will I sing? Will I stand? Will... No, you're going to face plant. We already know from Scripture. You're not standing. You're not singing. You're not speaking. You're face planting. Just, you know, prostrate before the Lord of glory on that sea of glass. That's what you're going to do. And so practice how to fall. Put your hands down so your nose isn't the first thing that hits. Some of you have to put your hands down a little further. Because your nose is a little bigger. But make sure your nose doesn't hit the sea of glass first. Just face plant. And then, as we studied the last couple weeks, the Lord stood him up. And the Lord makes us to stand. We don't stand in our own strength. And we saw that verse in Ephesians which says, having done all the stand, then stand. You know, stand fast in the Lord. Act like men. Be strong. And so the Lord stands him up. And then he puts his spirit in him. Now, you've got to understand, in the Old Testament, not everybody that was a follower of, of, of the Lord was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a New Testament thing. But he put his spirit in him, and then he sends him. He is sent. He didn't just went. He was sent. And he's sent with a message. And he's warned, listen, when you go, you don't add anything to it, Ezekiel. You don't take anything from it. What you need to be saying is, thus saith the Lord. I'm going to speak to you, and you tell them my words. Oh, and then he warns him, it's not going to be easy. He said, I'm sending you among people that are, that are firm of face, hard of heart, and stiff of neck. 
And they're going to be like briars and thorns and scorpions. In fact, when we get into chapter 3, we're going to get some more of that. And God's going to say, they're hard-headed, but I'm going to give you a harder head than theirs so that when you headbutt them. How many have ever witnessed one of your family members? It feels like you're headbutting them. Well, listen, your head by God is made harder than their head. You see, you didn't know that about yourself, did you? So if I tell you you're hard-headed, that's a compliment. I'm not degrading you, you hard-headed bunch of people, as long as the hardness comes from the Lord in preparation to take the message. So speak my words. I'm going to send you to people that don't want to hear, won't hear, they're rebellious, but nonetheless, don't you be rebellious. And so we went through that whole section, and then we came to verse 8 of chapter 2, and now we're going to go into this next section. But he says this, But, but thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give thee. Now we have this wonderful scene. And we've seen this scene before. In fact, when we study Jeremiah, as you go through Jeremiah, uh, we see that Jeremiah has offered the same thing, this book. We'll read the passage in a moment. We see it in Revelation chapter 10. Where John the Revelator, the one who's dictating the words of Jesus, revealing you know, Jesus and all of his glory, what's going to happen in the future, is told to do the same thing. They're offered a book. And this book, as it were, is written on both sides, we're going to see. And the reason why it's written on the both sides is so that we can't put footnotes, crib notes, or add anything to it. God says what he means and means what he says. And then they're going to be told, as we're going to see in a few moments, to eat this book, consume it. The word becoming flesh in them. Because that's the message. And it will be sweet in their mouth. When we understand the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the promises of God, the protection, the provision, all of those things that are written in the word, the promises. You know, I, I've read to a, a, a nauseam different commentators on how many promises they think are in the Bible. Uh, I've settled on the least, and the least is about 3,000. As we went through Ephesians chapter 1, just recently on Sunday mornings, we saw seven blessings. Those aren't promises. Those are general blessings. And, and listen, so many promises fall into those blessings. But about 3,000 promises, and those things are sweet. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will listen, according to my riches in heavenly places, through Christ Jesus, I'll take care of all of your needs. And just the promises go on and on and on. But there's also contained in his word, not just the promises of God, but there's contained the warnings and the judgments if you don't heed the warnings. And so it might be sweet in your mouth. But then when you look around and see people that aren't accepting Christ in our time and in our day, just like in Ezekiel's day, those people won't turn from their idolatry back to serve the true and living God. And when you understand when they're warned and they don't heed the warning, what's going to happen to them, it becomes bitter in our stomach. Because we have people we care about, we love. They're not our enemies. They don't know the Lord. They make a mockery of his name. And you know what's coming down the pike for them. It's bitter in your stomach. Sweet in your mouth because you've received the word. But bitter in your stomach as you understand that those who don't come to faith in Christ, who aren't born again by the Spirit, washed in his blood, filled with the Spirit, you know what their future is. And you know, as I know, time is running out for them to get in. Now, thank God that there's a second bus. We want to get on the first bus because it has cushioned seats, air ride seats, as it were, and air conditioning. That's the church. The second one, you die a martyr's death, and there's a multitude coming out of that time. The Bible says nobody can number, but you, listen, you don't want to be on that bus. Well, I guess you'd rather be on that bus than to be left behind at the bus station. Amen? So it's bitter in our stomach. So let's read this. So, and, and there's some real application for us in this. So he says this. Be not rebellious as those re the rebellious house of Israel, but open your mouth and eat what I give thee. In the other words, eat what I give thee. He hasn't seen it yet. Don't ask questions. You know? Um, and then he says in verse 9, And when I look, behold, a hand. Just a hand. Kind of like the handwriting on the wall that, uh, you know, showed up in Babylon when they were abusing the instruments of worship. Just a hand was sent to me, and lo, a roll of a book. Now, understand in those days, 
you know, this leaflet style book is a fairly new invention. Back in those days, things were scrolls. But they also could be called a book. And so it's a scroll that's being offered to him, lo, this roll or scroll of a book was therein, it's in the hand, and he spread it before me, he unrolled it, this hand, so there might be two hands, they're unrolling this thing before him, and it was written within and without on both sides, no room for me to add anything to it. It was written on both sides, and there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. And so he's given this book, and then we move into chapter 3, where we start our study tonight. And it says, And moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, I understand. And again, 60 times in Ezekiel, God's going to refer to Ezekiel as the Son of Man. I think it's a great title. What it literally means, as we said before, is son of Adam or son of a human being. That I understand your frailties. I understand your weaknesses. I understand your failings and your faults. I get all of that. But my calling is my empowering. And so the Lord just reminds Ezekiel, I know that you're but a man with all of the frailties and faults of a man. But I'm putting my spirit in you and I'm sending you and I'm sending you with my message and you need to be obedient. And so eat this thing, son of man. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat thou what thou findest. Eat this roll and then go speak unto the house of Israel. And so later in your, in, in, in your convenience, look up Jeremiah chapter 36, verses 1 and 2. In fact, I think it goes to about the first five verses of 36, where, where Jeremiah, before he was sent to prophesy, to warn, and he's, he is a contemporary with Ezekiel and Daniel, to warn before the captivity actually came, he was handed a scroll. And we just finished Revelation not so long ago on Sunday mornings, and we see that at one point, John is given a scroll, and told to eat as well. It's the word of God. And it was sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. And so this no doubt represents the word of the Lord. And he's told to consume it. To eat it. May it go down into his belly. May he digest it. Is the idea. Chew on it. Think about it. May it become a part of you. You know, Jeremiah said that he couldn't but prophesy because after eating the book, he said, the word burned in me. There was a fire that came from it. There was a passion that was in it. There was a desire to know it and to fulfill it and complete it. And so every Christian that will ever be used of the Lord, listen, has to be one who has spent time digesting the word. In fact, in the New Testament, we're told not just to read the Bible. Now, I, I, I think it's great that you have a Bible reading program. I think we should. In fact, we used to have it on our website that you could read through the Bible, so many Old Testament, so many New Testament verses. We took it down because we found that people were just reading it. And we'd ask questions like, what did you get out of it? I don't know, but I read the chapter. Well, the Bible doesn't say read. The, the Bible doesn't say read it. It says study it. Study it to show yourself approved of God, a workman who need not to be ashamed, who can rightly divide the word of truth. And so the imagery here for Ezekiel, as it was for Jeremiah, as it was for Daniel, I mean, and John, and you see other people, it is to consume the word so that it becomes part of the nourishment of your life, that you, as a word, that you're chewing on it, you're thinking about it, you're digesting it, is nourishing you, the word of God, because it is living and it is powerful. It is effective and it is sufficient. And it never returns void. So before you go, you have to know that you're sent. You have to know that you're empowered by the Spirit. And you have to know what the message is. And the message is always the Word of God. And then he says, so open your mouth. And he caused me, he caused me, I like that. He caused me to eat that roll, to eat that book. And you know, the moment I got saved, I've told you this, that you know, I, I, I had a lot of addictions before I got saved. I was addicted to alcohol and certain drugs and just addicted to things. You know how it is when you're in the flesh and, and, and you're in bondage to the wicked one and you've been captured by him and, and the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, you know, the, the pride of life is all cooking in you. And so you're addicted to these things. And when you get saved and are born again, the Spirit sets you free. 
But one of the things I found out that I was still, I traded those addictions for an addiction to know God's Word. I remember getting up early just to read it and, and try to figure out what it was saying. And I remember going out to my car when I had a job and just sitting in the car to eat my lunch, reading God's Word. I, I could never go to bed at night. Many times I'd fall asleep reading God's Word, and I would wake up in the morning, my Bible would be on my chest or laying over, and I'd roll over and wrinkle the pages. And I've even had to iron my Bible a few times to get the pages back fixed because I just, I became a Bible junkie. Nobody told me this, but then I thought, well, you know, I read somewhere in the scripture that I need to hide his word in my heart. And so I started memorizing verses. And when I got up to about 300 verses, then I started memorizing chapters. Then I thought, well, you know, if the day ever comes where our Bibles are taken from us, what book of the Bible would be the most important? What book of the Bible could I warn people, instruct people, teach people how to live? Well, and I actually memorized. I can't do it now. I'm getting old. I can't remember what day of the week it is. I have to ask people, is it prayer tomorrow? But I used to be able to quote, maybe not word for word, but pretty close word for word, the whole book of Ephesians, all six chapters. Because David, King David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. And I think every serious Christian that desires to be used of the Lord has to be a man and woman of the word. You have to eat it. You have to chew on it. You have to consume it. It has to become part of you. So that when you're talking to people, it just flows out of you. Because all we have to offer, the only message of healing and hope, the only message of salvation to this world is God's word. And it ought to be so a part of us that it just flows from us. Amen? So that's what he's saying here. In verse 3, he says, And so he said unto me, Son of man, he caused me, son of man, man, cause thy belly to eat. The idea is cause your belly to be full and fill thy bowels with this scroll, with this roll, with this book that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. Just like it says in Psalms 119. Thy word as as sweet as honey. But he tells us earlier that when he'd eat it, it was bitter. It, it had lamentations and woes. So there's a two-edged sword of God's word. There's the blessing on those who respond to it. And then there's kind of the cursing on those who reject it. It's the same thing that, 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 that Moses put pen to paper in Deuteronomy chapter 28 when he was warning the children of Israel in the re-giving of the law. And that's what, by the way, Deuteronomy means. It means the re-giving of the law. As he was re-giving the law to them, he came to chapter 20 and said, now listen. If you will keep God's commandments and walk in his ways, keep his precepts, and do what he tells you, you're going to be blessed. And he talks about all of the blessings. Oh, those things are sweet. But he says, but if you don't, here are the cursings, and those things are bitter. And so that's the idea. Contained in God's word is the blessings to those who are, are obedient, who bow their knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Oh, and by the way, part of being obedient is when you blow it, repent. It doesn't mean perfect. It means obedient. So you're doing your best to be obedient and you are ensnared or trip or fall. What's the next thing you need to do if you're going to stay obedient? You repent. You get up and you keep moving. Amen? So that's all contained in it. And so he says, man, it was sweet. It was like sweetness. Verse 4. And he said unto me, son of man, go get thee to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. You know, I was ordained in a denomination before I became a Calvary pastor. And I was told by, there were some retired pastors in this congregation, that I had to quit the ministry because I didn't know how to preach. All you know how to, to teach. And what they were saying is, I don't know how to entertain. I don't know how to bounce on one foot and get the, and it does. You know, I just didn't know how to do that. They said, you just stand in the pulpit and you say, turn in your Bible and you just, it's, Really? You're not here to see me. I hope not. That's why we do radio instead of television, because I don't need to be seen. People will turn it off if they saw me. You know, I had a guy come here from Lodi a number of years ago, and I was telling the guys about a few years ago what that could be. That could be 20 years ago. It could be 10 years ago. Just the other day, Kyle will tell you, just the other day could be years. I mean, I have no concept of time. But a guy came from Lodi, retired in our community to be a part of this church. 
And so I'm out there in the foyer. He walks in. He says, could you introduce me to Pastor Mike? I said, you're talking to him. He looked at me and says, wow, I thought you'd be a lot taller. That's why we do radio. Amen? Yay. I'll leave it alone. Let's move on. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. Here's a point I want to make, and it's a very important point. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, Paul makes an incredible observation. He says to us in this kind of allegorical way, the farmer must be first partaker of the fruit. And then he says, consider what I say and may the Lord give you wisdom. Well, what's he saying? You can't give what you do not have. Because if the farmer doesn't have seed, he can grow no crop. If you don't have the word of God in you, you cannot be used of the Lord to give it away. Listen, if you don't have COVID-19, you can't give it to somebody else. I know that's a bad analogy. Or if you don't have the flu, or if you have the measles, you have to be infected with something to be able to give it away to somebody else. And for you to be able to be used of the Lord to minister under the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of His Word, you have to have it in you. And so he says, digest this and then go, and you speak to them. For thou art not sent, get this, thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. I'm not sending you to foreigners. Now, I've, I, I've spoken in Uganda. You know, I've been in areas where they have the Tororan language or Ucholi. I've been up in the Sudan and trained chaplains where I had to have two interpreters. They had Nubian, Aramaic, and then a Choli. And so I would say a few words, and this guy would say a few words, and that guy would say a few words, and I realized that the guy on the end down there was saying more than the rest of us. And so I had to stop during this teaching and say, listen, you say what I say. Because he had a little bit of an evangelistic, you know, pastoral flair to him, and I think he was just, you know, adding to it, man. And I said, listen, we, got, we don't have all day. And it's going through two interpreters already. It says, I'm not sending you to strangers. I'm sending you to the house of Israel. I'm sending you to people who understand your culture, understand your language, and should definitely understand what you're saying. They, they should know better, Ezekiel. Now, Jonah. Jonah was sent to a people of a different language. He was sent to a different culture. Remember, Jonah didn't want to go. And when you read the book of Jonah, it's very interesting because it says that when God called him to go to Nineveh, he hated the Ninevites. He wanted God to smoke the Ninevites. He, you know, they were considered to be the offscouring of the world. They were vile infidels. They, they were considered by, by those of Judaism, because they were Gentiles, to be fodder for the fires of hell. And, 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 you know, and Jonah says, Lord, I know who you are. And that if you send me with your message, then they're going to get saved. And I don't want them to get saved. So he goes, you know, he goes first down to Joppa, running the opposite direction, down to Joppa, down to the seashore, down to the docks, down in the boat, and then overboard and down into the belly of a fish, and then down. When you run from God, it's a downhill slide. And then up he comes. Literally, up Chuck. And he heads for Nineveh. Can you imagine when he shows up in Nineveh? Bleached out, seaweed, smelly, stinky, squid probably hanging off of him, you know, all that fish. And he walks into the middle of Nineveh, which he hates, a foreign language. They don't even understand his language. And he gives an eight-word sermon. Yet 40 days, and God's going to overthrow. And then he leaves. And the whole place, the whole city. There, there said there was 200,000 children in the city that didn't know their left hand from their right. It took two weeks to walk through the city. And the king of the city declared a fast that they would cry out. Read it there in, in Jonah. Cry out to God. In fact, not only did the, the men fast and the women fast, the children fast, the babies fast. They had their dogs and cats fasting. Everybody fasted. And they cried out in repentance that God would forgive them of their sin. 
Now watch what, what, what God says to Ezekiel here. I find this interesting in light of that. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech or of a hard language, but I'm sending you to the house of Israel. These are my people. And then he says this, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou canst not understand. For surely, had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto me, just like Nineveh did. It just seems like, and this is the pattern we get to the New Testament, is it not? When, when Paul is called by the Holy Spirit there in Antioch, Syria, I got to be in that little cave church a few years ago when I visited the seven churches in Asia Minor, Turkey, and, and they flew us over there. The first place we started, after we came into Istanbul, we flew over to uh, Antioch, Syria, and we got to go into the Jewish quarter there and into the church where the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Paul into the work I've called them to, and the whole missionary endeavor started. And as Paul went out, his pattern was really simple. Go to the synagogue first. If there was a synagogue, always minister to the Jew first, and if the Jew rejects, then to the Gentile. And the Gentiles received the message of grace. And the Jews would foo-foo it. And they would reject it. And they would persecute Paul. And so it was in the Old Testament. He said, if I hadn't sent you, like I sent Jonah to Nineveh, they would have listened. But what is wrong with my own people? Why are my own people firm in face, hard in heart, and stiff in neck. Why are they rebellious? They should know better, is the idea. But to the house of Israel will, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. And I think that's an important point. Sometimes we think when we bring God's message to people, as God sends us, as He moves us by the Spirit to go witness to one of our family members, a neighbor, or friend, we think that when we are being rejected that we are being rejected. And we take it personal. Stop it. They're not rejecting you. You're just the mailman. You didn't write it. You're not responsible for how they respond to it. You're just there to open up the thing, put it in, and put the flag up, got mail. Well, I guess you don't do snail mail anymore. You're the person that's you know sending it, but you're just the mailman. And so many times we don't deliver the mail. Think with me for a few moments. Well, let me just ask. How many of you um, fear being rejected by people that you bring the message to? Or have had that in your, in your life in times past? We need to get past that and we need to get over that. Um, because God's not the author of fear. We know who is. And sometimes Satan wants, because I think personally one of the things that uh, we despise the most, the thing we fear the most, the thing we want to have the least to do with is rejection. I think it's kind of built into our fallen nature that we just, we can't stand rejection. And we'll do anything not to be rejected. In fact, sometimes we'll be rebellious and not do what God tells us to do because we can't stand human rejection. And I think that's why Paul, I mean, why Ezekiel was told by God, listen, don't you be rebellious like them. Don't worry about if they reject you because they're not rejecting you, Ezekiel. They're rejecting me. And you need to get past that. You need to understand that. And that's what he's saying there in verse 7. For they will not hearken unto me. It's me they're rejecting. For all the house of Israel is impudent and they are hard-hearted. They are hard of head and hard of heart. Behold, because they're that way, guess what God does for us? Behold, you know, I used to take offense to people saying, you're just hard-headed, until I studied Ezekiel. And I, I've had people say to me afterwards, you know, you're just hard-headed. And I say, thank you. I didn't mean that as a compliment. I know you didn't. But God gave me this hard head. Right here in Ezekiel, listen to what it says. He said, behold, I have made thy face strong against their face, and your forehead Strong against their forehead. Because when you butt heads, it ain't going to hurt you. Hard-headed. I know a few people in this church that have that gift. And it says, as a stone, 
like rock, like flint, harder than flint even, he says, I have made thy forehead. Fear them not, that's a commandment. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Stop being afraid of them. I have anointed you, and I have sent you, and I've sent you with my message. You're my representative, and if they reject the message, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Oh, oh, and by the way, not only did I put my spirit in you, I gave you a hard head. It's hard as flint, harder than flint. So that when you butt heads with them, you're not going to be hurt or affected. And then he says, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words, all of them, all my words, all my words, that I, ha- that I shall speak unto thee, Receive first in your heart. Take them to heart. May they have an effect on you first. Take them to heart. Think about them. Meditate on them. Muse over them. Consider what they mean. Find the application. Put it in your own life. Let it affect you. You know, we're not here regurgitating something from our intellect. I hope pastors don't do that. I hope that that the word has become flesh in them first. That they've been a recipient of God's grace and of his mercy and of his forgiveness. That they understand how to stand up and walk. All of those things are important to us first. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, I know that you're but a mere man, but all my words that I shall speak unto thee receive first in your heart. And hear them in thy ears. Um, The idea is you receive them in your heart. It's because you're willing to be obedient to them. They're affecting you. They're affecting you in the innermost part of your being. Um, The problem is never with our hearing. In fact, we're going to see as we move through here and into chapter 4 that God's going to tell this prophet um, actually to paint a portrait. Because they're not going to hear because it's going to go in one ear and out the other, but it's not going to go in one eye gate and out the other eye gate, so he's going to give illustrative sermons. When we get into chapter 4, it's a whole series of illustrative sermons. Because the problem is not with the hearing. It's never with our physical hearing. The problem is with hearing with our heart. That's why Jesus ended every exhortation that he gave to those seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He ended every one of those exhortations, as it were, those short little pithy epistles to those seven churches. He ended it by saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, the Spirit doesn't just speak to our intellect. It speaks to our heart. So he's saying to Ezekiel, listen, as you're digesting this book, as you're musing over the word, as you're chewing it, as you're getting all of the nourishment out of it, I want you not just to hear it with your ear. I want you to sense it and accept it in your heart. All the words that I've given to you. And then when that transformation has taken place, verse 11 says, and then go. Go. Go do the things I've told you to do. And we're under the same, listen, we're under the same commandment in the New Testament. We come to Matthew chapter 28. You get down to verses 18, 19, and 20. And what is the commandment? And by the way, it's written as a commandment. It's an imperative, what we call an imperative in a Greek. It's not a suggestion. And we don't get to say to him, well, that's not my particular gift, so I'm not required to go. He said, listen, to his disciples, are you a disciple of Christ? Am I a disciple of Christ? Are we disciples of Christ? Are we followers of the Messiah? Are we redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Is He our Lord? Is He our Master? Then we're disciples. Can you say it out loud? I'm a disciple of Christ. Say it out loud. That ain't even loud. I've seen some of you guys get excited about things. You get much louder than that. Say it again. I'm a disciple of Christ. I like it. Mikey likes it. Well, here's the deal. (laughs) <laughs> hey, don't be nudging each other about that. We can have fun here. If you're a disciple of Christ, then you're under a commandment, an imperative. Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, 20. Go ye, as he's told Ezekiel to go to these people that are hard-hearted and stiff-necked, he tells us, go. 
Go into all the world and preach this gospel to every living creature. And when they get saved, make disciples out of them. Disciple them. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So we're under a similar commandment because we are filled with the Spirit. We have the complete canonization of this Word. And we are sent. And so he says to them, after you digest it, then go and get thee to them of the captivity of the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them. Here's what you say. Thus saith the Lord God. Let it be my words. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to take from it. You don't have to water it down. You don't have to make it palatable. See, that's the problem with most pulpits today. We think if we just teach it like it is, people will leave. Well, let them leave. Paul said they went out from us because they never were of us. Because if they had been of us, if they had been born again, hungry for the word of God, they would have stayed right there in the pew. Because we are not commanded to make it palatable. We are commanded to say, thus saith the Lord. Just as clear, crystal clear as we can make it. Because the souls of men, their eternal destiny is at stake. That's why Jesus said, you must, to a very religious man, you must, Nicodemus, be born again. You can't see, enter, or understand the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. The natural man does not understand the things of God. Neither can he know them. You must be born again. Everything starts with our challenge to people. You must be born again. Well, how does that happen? You receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, how do you do that? You listen to what he says in his word, and faith is stirred in your heart. And by faith, you say, I, I agree that he is God incarnate, that the God the Father sent God the Son to be the Redeemer, that he died a, su a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross. His blood has cleansed me. He rose again to prove that he's a life-giving spirit and he's ever before the Father making intercession for me. And I open my heart and I accept him in as my Lord and my Savior. And then when you're born again, you love God's Word. You even love the corrective part of it. How many like to, man, I was just thinking the other day, Lord, I, I thank you that those times that are hard, they have such a refining effect on me. I'm glad I'm not always on the mountaintop. Because to get to another mountaintop, you got to go through a what? Valley. Unless you can fly. But those things are good for us. And so he says, listen, when you go, there's only one message. And you better not mess with it. I think, um, as I've been asked by Bree and Call, uh, the, the assignment I've been given is to speak on the sufficiency of God's word. You know, when, when I was talking to T.A. McMahon, who runs Brian Call, uh, one of the things that um, was going through my mind as we were talking about this is a, a quote that uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon made. Uh, there was a newspaper uh, man that was interviewing him for the local um, uh, news periodical, and they said to him, do you ever feel like you need to defend God's Word? And... Of course, I wasn't there, but what has been said by the commentators, he got a smile on his face and said, do you ever feel like you need to defend a lion? No, you just let him go. He's more than capable of defending himself. You see, I believe that the uncompromised, unadulterated word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it will cut through the flesh and it'll go right down into the heart. And it will be a discerner of the thoughts and intents of a man and of a woman. Why do I believe that? Because that's what happened to me 46 years ago. Went to a Bible study up in the mountain, stoned. And when that guy began to share the word, I sobered up and it cut to the heart of the issue. You need to give me your life. And I will give you peace and hope. I heard it clear. And I know the sufficiency of God's word. And I'm telling you, whether you're listening by live stream or radio or whatever. Listen, you won't see, understand, or even enter the kingdom of heaven if you are not born again. And when you are born again, when you let the word of God do that work in your heart, it will be amazing how you see so clearly. And so he said, man, when you go, you just say, thus saith the Lord. Make sure everything you say are my words, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Remember earlier, he said the same thing back in chapter two. He said, listen, I'm telling you, they're not going to hear, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they hear 
or reject. What does matter is that there was a prophet in the land. There was somebody that spoke for me who properly represented me in the land. And I think for two reasons. Number one, I think we need to warn people. Listen, man, the sun is setting. The time of the church, almost over. Ray Charles in his current condition can see that. Listen, man, it's not one thing. It's a hundred things that are going on at the same time. I mean, we're moving toward this at a very rapid rate. And we were told in Revelation, when we see these things happen, they're going to happen in rapid succession. The word used there is in tech. We get tachometer from that word. And who would have thought we'd be where we're at today two years ago? This month in March. And who would have thought that Biden could have brought about the, the ushering in of a new world order and the Antichrist and, and bring up China and Russia and put down the United States and can't all in just like one year? That guy's amazing. That's amazing to me. You, you know, we got to look at this one of two ways. You can look at him as being like a numbskull and not know what he's doing. Or you can look at him and say, man, that's the smartest man God ever called to get his program on track. Because this happened fast. I would have I would have never believed it if you'd have told me two years ago it'd be this fast. I said, I know it's coming, but I didn't know it's coming like a freight train. I didn't know it was coming at the speed of light. Listen, that guy's gonna go there and foul everything up, just like God wants him to do. And I, they should just keep him over there. We'd do better if he just would stay over there. And, and take the vice president with you. The passing of time. Really? You know nothing about the passing of time. But there's an eternity coming. And we won't know the passing of time. You see that speech? You probably didn't get it, so that was no reference to you. Well, I'm telling you, man, you talk about word solids that mean nothing. You need the gift of interpretation by the Holy Spirit to listen to her talk. Because you can't, it's like a different tongue. I'll move on. I'm, I know. I'll move on. But anyway, he's saying, listen, the spirit, then, then after he tells him, I don't care if they hear or don't hear, you speak my words. You go. And then he says in verse 12, listen, then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great, great uh, voice of great rushing saying, blessed, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. Actually, that Hebrew word for rushing can be interpreted also shaking. It could be like the rumbling of an earthquake. The ground, the mountains are fleeing away as this declaration is going forth. Blessed be the glory of Almighty God. And listen, what we need to understand is, listen, God is not diminished in His power because of the stupidity of humanity. Psalms 2 says he sits in the heavens and he laughs. He has them in his derision. Although the heathens rage and they plan an, an ill thing that they want to cast off their bands and they want to do their own thing. God's going to have, they're going to have their moment, but God will have his day. And I think that day is coming so soon. How many are ready for that day? Man, and if you're not, get on the right side of it. Anyway, let's read on. Just a little warning there. Say, I'm doing what he told me to do here. I'm warning you. Verse 13, I heard also the noise of the wings of these living creatures that touch one another and the noise of the wheels, that's the cherubim, over against them and the noise of the great rushing. So the spirit lifted me up and it took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. These things are churning in him as it were, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. He's seeing these visions. He's understanding the judgment that is to come if they don't repent. He's given the message of warning. It's sweet in his mouth. It's bitter in his stomach. All of these things are churning in him as God has put his spirit in him and sent him to speak his message. And he said, the Lord lifted me up and I went in the heat of my spirit. These things churning in me, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Abib and dwelt there by Shebar and I sat there, listen carefully, and I remained astonished like in a stupor. I mean these things are swirling and turning in him among them seven days. I find that interesting because in the priesthood if you are defiled by anything you have to be isolated as it were for seven days. 
And for seven days, Ezekiel is isolated from that which could contaminate him just to muse over all that has just transpired. Chapter 1, chapter 2, on into chapter 3. This experience. What God has commanded him to do. He's there for seven days. And then verse 16 says, And it came to pass at the end of those seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Now I want to read from verse 17 on down to verse um, 21. And then I'll come back and unpack it because I don't think it's exactly what you think it is. We use it that way to spur you along to witness. But um, I'm going to talk about something a little different. So verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. Now that's true for all of us. Amen? Didn't Jesus tell us as the church we need to be watching, sober-minded, ready, looking, anticipating? Are we not to be those? And, and the idea of a watchman is, a watchman, and you know this if, if any of you have been in the military, that you have night guards. The most important person at night was the night watchman. Because he had to stay up all night and make sure that he would sound the alarm if any danger came. Then you had day watchmen. We call them guards. And we're to be that. We're to be that for this generation. We're to be that for this culture. We are watchmen. And watchmen, when they see danger coming, are those who sound the alarm. And he said, listen, Ezekiel, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give, here it is, give them warning from me. You're a watchman. Hear my words and warn. That's what watchmen do. And then he lays an onus on Ezekiel. Um, again, we need to understand that this was a prophet. This is Old Testament. We need to take heed to the warning. We're, we're not... Um, we have a different warning. We'll see what Paul says. But, but I think we ought to take this to heart, even though it's not a severe for us as it was for Ezekiel. Well, you'll see when we get through it. He said, when I say unto the wicked, this is God dealing with the wicked person's heart. Oh, and by the way, listen, everybody you witness to, you got to understand the Holy Spirit's already working on that person. I know that for a fact because the Holy Spirit was working on me way before I came to know the Lord. Listen, the Bible says, and Jesus said, when I go away, I'm going to send another comforter. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, and did he not come on the day of Pentecost? He said, that Holy Spirit will convict men of sin. That's the world. We saw it on the day of Pentecost. You know, thousands cried out because their hearts were pricked by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit as Peter ministered the word and said, what must we do to be saved? You can rest assured that the Holy Spirit is working on people in this world because God loves them. He wants to draw them to this salvation. So he says here, listen, son of man, I made you a watchman of the house of Israel. Uh, therefore, hear the word from my mouth and give them warning. When I say, when I am dealing with the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way. To save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your and I don't think we're released completely from this. I know that this is a little stronger in the Old Testament. It's a little stronger to the prophets because the prophets were, were, were the watchmen who gave the warning. But we are watchmen in the New Testament. And I think there is some degree of responsibility that we hold. I love what Keith Green used to say. He used to say, we are responsible for this generation of believers. And can I say this to you? You're responsible for everyone who, who crosses paths with you to make sure they hear this gospel message that there's a God who stands willing and ready to forgive you of your sins, to heal your life, to give you hope and peace. We need to be sounding that alarm. And if you don't receive it and you die in your sins, you're going to be eternally separated from him in a place of torment. We need to give the warning and we need to give it as clear as we possibly can. 
He said, and then it will be required at your hands. Verse 19. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and they turn not from their wickedness, nor from their wicked way, he shall die in his iniquities, but thou shalt deliver thy soul. Now here's where I have a problem with, because I know what delivered my soul. It was the blood of Jesus. So it's not like I'm in jeopardy of losing my salvation if I don't witness. But I'll offer this for your consideration tonight. I've got a few more minutes to develop this. We're going to at least get through a few more verses. I think that one of the reasons when we get to heaven, Revelation chapter 21, and there the Bible says God wipes all tears from our eyes. I think one of the reasons why is there are going to be people that we know, that we love, that we cared about. But we were so afraid of being rejected by them or offending them. And we never spoke God's word to them. That we know because of our disobedience. That possibly they're going to face an eternity rejected from the Lord. I witnessed to every one of my friends when I got saved, they got tired of hearing me. In fact, I, I, I started telling them, there's a day coming. There's a day coming that you'll wish I'd taken a baseball bat and beat you into the kingdom. But I'm not going to be unfaithful to tell you there's a God of hope. There's a God of peace. There's a God of grace, a God of salvation. And he can put your life back together. But you've got to surrender it. You've got to give it up. You've got to let it go. You have to be born again. And so, to some degree, there is a responsibility laid upon us. Let me, let me read you this from Acts chapter 20. I hope they put it up on the screen. Acts chapter 20, verses 25 and 27. Paul picks up on this, 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 this theme here. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He doesn't have time to leave the coastline to go up all the way into Ephesus. So he calls for the elders of the church of Ephesus, the church that was most endeared to him, I believe. We're going through that book on Sunday mornings. But as they come down to the seashore, they're at Miletus. They're hugging one another. They're, they're weeping. Because Paul says, from this point on, you'll see my face no more. I know what awaits me when I go to Jerusalem. I know I'm going to be arrested. I know that by the Spirit of the Lord. I know I'm going to be sent to Rome. And it's curtains. You know, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. But as he's getting ready to leave those elders, and they're hugging and they're weeping, it's a very passionate and very intimate moment. He says this. He says, and now, behold, I know that you all, see, he's from southern Judea, ye all, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more, not in this life. And aren't those partings, they're just, they're devastating, aren't they? Because we've had to say goodbye to people that in this life will see their face no more. But we don't sorrow as others have no hope because we know there's a day coming when there's a reunion in our Father's house. My mom, my dad will be there. My older sister. I pray my younger sister. I pray, Lori, if you're hearing this, I know I've been looking at the stuff that you've been posting and I know that you've told Kyle that you and the Lord are fine. Make sure that you open your heart and say, Jesus, be not only my Savior, but my Lord. Let that Spirit do its work in your heart like it did in mine. We're going to see those people again. And Paul says this, Wherefore I take you to record, what a marvelous thing Paul was able to say. I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all, there he is again, you all, the counsel of God. I gave it all to you. I didn't hold anything back. And I think one of the most freeing things that we're ever going to be able to say to the Lord is, Lord, I was obedient. You put your spirit in me, you sent me, and I did not fail to give everybody that came in contact with me the whole counsel of God. Well, let's read on. Again, when, then he says, uh, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity. Now, this is part of our responsibility in the brotherhood. It doesn't quite apply in the Old Testament because he's talking about those who walk away and get into idolatry. They're going to be judged and eternally damned. 
There are Christians in the New Testament, they can be believers with bad behavior. Or they can be, like we study there in Galatians, they can be overtaken in a fault. And we're to bear their burdens. We are to correct them. The Bible says, faithful in Proverbs are the wounds of a friend. So you are and I am in the New Testament. Listen, I, I think that we are required of the Lord to warn people, to lead people to Christ. And then when we're in Christ, if we see our brother straying, we need to warn him. We need to help him back on the straight and narrow path. He says, and when a righteous man doth turn from his righteous and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, I'm correcting him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin and his righteousness, which he hath done, because it's based on works in the Old Testament. The righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will be required at your hand. I thank God that, listen, I'm washed in the blood. And when I get there, listen, I'm, my works are going to be tried as by fire. And because uh, the foundation I'm building on, the materials I've been given to build on the foundation, which is Christ, is wood, hay, and stubble, and precious stone, and jewels, silver, and gold. And when he tries my life, the things that I've done for myself, the times I weren't obedient, that'll be burned away. The things I've done for the Lord will remain. And it says some people will lose everything. There'll be no reward. You, you were rebellious like them. You didn't go. You didn't warn. You didn't correct. But you're still saved. But why? And then maybe, maybe, I don't know. They'll start mentioning some names. I sent you to that person. And to this person. And to the other person. And they won't be with us in the kingdom. Because you were the man. You were the woman. And you didn't go. Oh, you're safe. You're okay. You're safe. I think tears are going to come down our face. And God says, it's okay. I want to make all things new. And you'll wipe them from us. I don't know. My warped opinion. You can have one too. I just think that. Um, where do we leave off? What verse? Verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that, um, that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will talk with thee there. We'll have to end there in verse 22 tonight. And I will talk with thee there. What a remarkable series of events that we're seeing in the life of Ezekiel. What a remarkable experience he has with the Lord. And then just the Lord standing him up, filling him with the Spirit, sending him, putting his words in his heart and in his mouth, in his belly to digest, reminding him, don't be disobedient, and laying upon him, as it were, the responsibility of a prophet to go into the world and to preach and proclaim, listen, uh, this warning that God had given him. And... He's going to be obedient. And I like the equipping that he gets. Yeah, you're going out there and those people will be hard-headed, but I will make your head harder. Uh, don't fear their looks or their faces or their words. Oh, yeah, there are thorns and thistles. Man, they are scorpions and they bite. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You better worry more about me and being obedient to me than you worry about them. Amen? And then next week, we're going to see that God gives him a series of illustrated sermons. You see, because if and he's going to say they're not going to hear, he says, so I'm going to cause them to see. You know, and, and just give you a kind of a prelude to next week's message. What does it say in the New Testament about us? We are epistles read of all men. What does that mean? It means people are watching us and drawing their conclusions of God by what they see in us. Guess what we are? We are illustrated sermons. Amen? Because people who won't hear will watch. People who won't listen will see. You see, it can go in one ear, as the old adage says, and out the other, but it can't go in one eye and out the other because once it goes into the eye gate, visually it's lodged. 
and their conscience. To this day, I can see the man, the first guy that really looked me in the face, Dwayne Bird, 1974. Toward the end of 1974 at White Eagle Gas Station, Oroville Boulevard, Oroville, California. I was getting gas. He was getting gas. And he turned around and looked at me. I knew him from school. He said, Mike, I want to tell you something. I want you to listen. God loves you. And you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. He's got a better plan for you. That's all he said. Put the pump away. I put my pump away. We left. Those words wrecked me for months. It ruined me for this world. Because the very thing he said was what I was longing for and couldn't find. And the Holy Spirit just kept working on that. Listen, man, be obedient. It can be just that simple. The other day, down at All Metals in Oroville, picking up some steel for a little project I had, the guy brings my iron over. I was telling the guys on Monday night, and he's all hung over, man. I, I, I looked at him. I said, are you doing okay? I said, you look like you've been drugged through a knothole backwards. He goes, man, rough night, man. I'm hung over. I said, well, I, I, used to, I used to experience that. I know what it's like. I said, but I don't have that problem anymore. I haven't had it for 46 years. I gave my life to Jesus, and he changed it. I got a peace now, and I, and I got just, and I'm getting drunk in the spirit, and I don't have those hangovers anymore. And he looked at me, and he's just, Kept loading the steel, trying to, here you go. And then he left. The Lord will cook in his heart on that. Amen. It can be just that simple.